When this decade began, it would have been difficult to find a hundred people who had ever heard the name Elton John. Yet today, six years later, Elton John stands alone at the very top of superstardom. Fact. Two of his last three albums, Captain Fantastic and the Brown Dirt Cowboy and Rock of the Westies, entered the best-selling album charts at number one, something no other recording artist had ever accomplished. Fact. Elton John has made more money and sold more records in one year, 1975, than any recording artist in history. Fact. He sold out six nights in New York's Madison Square Garden this month. That's more than 120,000 people. No one has ever done that before. Just who is this man that in so short a time has captured the imagination of so many millions of us? To find out, we went to see Elton John a few weeks ago at his New York hotel suite. He met us in a long, flowing red dressing gown with the now famous initials E.J. monogrammed in white. During the two hours we spent with him, he was friendly and open and candid in his responses to our questions. If anything, the man whose extroverted ways are legendary seemed a bit shy and reserved. As our talk began, the subject of his current sellout tour was the first thing on our mind. How do the tours come about? Is it something that you do uh, every two years or whenever the spirit moves you or you just sit around one day and you decide, I'd like to get on stage again. Let's, uh, let's get a tour together. I mean, how, how does uh, well, in America, they usually worked out in about a year in advance because they have to be. I mean, you just can't say, oh, well, I'm going to tour America and just suddenly whip over it because there are uh, visas and things like that and buildings to get. We were planning this tour of the East Coast last year uh, because we did the West Coast. And... Uh, more or less it was decided that this was going to be like the last tour for quite some time because uh, recently anyway uh, because we, uh, we I've just had enough of going on the road for the moment and uh, I just want to sort of relax and do other things which I don't have the time to do if I'm still sort of running around the world so <clears throat> but this, this tour and um, this East Coast tour that we're doing now is more or less planned last year because I couldn't I couldn't afford I just no way I could have done a whole tour of America last year is it is it's um on the one hand, I guess it's extremely grueling, and I think you've also been quoted somewhere, I read somewhere, where it's the most fun for you, getting on stage. Yeah, so it's like it's nothing it still is, but I'm, I, <clears throat> I'm sort of getting to the point now where I, I have a feeling that if I carried on much longer, it wouldn't be the most fun for me on stage. It would just be sort of, uh, I don't know, just a beginning to get like a bit of a sort of robot uh, machine type thing, which I d never wanted it to be. So I, I just have an instinct gut feeling like I did when I changed the band, and I'm just going to come off the road for a time. I, just, I really need it. So after six years, you know, you, sort of, you really do need to stop and sort of gather yourself and do a little bit of other things, uh, other interests. You have anything particular in mind? Things that will interest oh, you? Oh, yeah. I mean, I want, I'm not going to sort of say, hey, I'm not going to do any music anymore. I'm going to produce Kiki in September. And I've got my soccer club, which I'm chairman of, which I'll be taking a lot of time over next year because I, I sort of, being a chairman, you do have to sort of sit down and run things and uh, you just can't sort of hop off month after month. You have to be there when things are going on. And I was looking forward to that a lot. Can we go back to the beginning for uh, maybe just uh, spend a couple of minutes covering um, uh, life before uh, Elton John became a household name when Elton John was not even Elton John. It starts in, uh, in England, in, uh, in Pinner, Middlesex. And uh, just again, if you could kind of recap, Elton, for people who don't know how you got into music, how that came about, the story of uh, uh, the piano and, and, and your mother and uh, some records and... Uh, it began, I think, when um, you started just uh, teaching yourself to play piano at a really young age? Yeah, when I was about four. I just had a piano in the house and I taught myself. I was persuaded to have lessons by that when I was about seven or eight. And I hated having lessons, but uh, and I was sort of forced to go to the Royal Academy of Music. I, passed, I sort of went there every Saturday after going to school, Monday to Fridays. Was it the standard kind of lesson? Bah, 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 no, bah, I mean, it was, I, it, was, I, it was quite good by then. <laughs> uh, no, you know, you just, you win a scholarship if you're any good. And I took all, there's eight grades you can take in music in England. And I passed my grade eight and I used to go to the academy and study. And I, I used to play truant. Uh, I just didn't enjoy it very much at the time. I'm grateful for it now uh, because I, you know, it did help me. I can see that actually going to all those sort of classes and studying chord structures and things like that. Uh, did sort of help out in the end, which I didn't think they would be doing when I was doing it. All I wanted to do was uh, go to a soccer match on a Saturday. Uh, but, you know, it was useful, and I used to like singing in the choir, but uh, as far as actually doing it, I was sort of it was a pain in the arse, really, going to the, the academy on a Saturday when I should have been able to go 
it was like my free day because Sunday was homework. Mm -hmm. So I realized I just had a seven seven day schedule, which I resented. When did you first uh, maybe have that flash about uh, liking music enough to um, do it as a career? Always. Uh, that's all I ever wanted to do. You know? uh, but uh, I was uh, the Academy came at the time of rock and roll, and uh, I was more interested in Jerry Lee Lewis and Fats Domino and people like that than uh, actually playing Chopin. Or, you know, it wasn't exactly my cup of tea. And what side of this uh, uh, musical fence were your parents on? They were obviously trying to uh, push you in the Chopin's direction. No, my father was probably. Uh, my mother didn't really mind. She, in fact, bought the first Elvis Presley record and, and Bill Haley and the comments and all that. Uh, so my mother was pretty hip. My father could never be hip if he went, you know, no way. If you went through 25 courses of EST, you'd never be here. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> Your parents, um, what do they think? Of, um, do, you have a, do you have a chance to get feedback from them uh, on what's happened to you? Oh, well, my parents divorced. My father and mother divorced when I was about 14. Uh, so I have a stepfather now and a stepmother. No, I didn't have a stepmother. My, my dad remarried him. Uh, I think my dad, was, my dad was always a sort of snob, so I'm... Mean, he would have preferred me to have been in the Air Force, I still, even now, you know. Even now, this yeah, is... I still think it's a bit sort of demeaning for him to have somebody who's sort of playing piano and rock and roll. Uh, my mother, you know, she's fine, she doesn't mind at all. She's thrilled, but my real father, I don't think, you know, would have preferred me to have worked, worked in a bank or something like that. Something, you know, really respectable and boring, like he is. When uh, <laughs> your mother brought home those... <laughs> uh, uh, where does he live? Is he, where does he, where does I he don't know, and I don't mm -hmm. care. Uh, I, he used to live in Liverpool, mm -hmm. uh, but I just, uh, he just made a statement in the press that he's got, he's got a six-year-old son that can play piano better than I can now, so the world awaits another Elton John, shriek, God, horror. I just feel sorry for those four kids he's got. He remarried and has four kids, and... Uh, so they'll be half uh, brothers and sisters of yours? Yeah, they'll all end up in the Air Force, they'll be piano playing bank clerks, you see. <laughs> <laughs> That uh, those record that that Bill Haley and the Comets record and the Elvis Presley record that your mom brought home. What, had you heard those records on the radio and known them, or no. was it a totally no. fresh experience when you put the record down on the turntable? No, well, my mom was used to go and like buy a couple of records a week, so she just used to pop into the local record store. And uh, I'd never heard of Elvis Presley or Bill Haley at that time. And uh, I remember when she bought them home, I was so knocked out with them, I couldn't believe it. And it was just like after listening to Guy Mitchell and people like that, this was a totally new sort of sort of music. And uh, then after she bought the record home, I went and had my hair cut in the barber shop, and uh, I saw an ar article in Life, I think, on Elvis Presley, and it sort of, which, the pictures which, I couldn't imagine, you know, the pictures were amazing, I couldn't believe it. Which Elvis record was it? It was Heartbreak Hotel, of and the Bill Haley record was ABC Boogie. The American singers were very, very popular, and in fact, it was like English singers always used to copy, make sort of cover records of uh, American records. You Joe know. Stafford. Yeah, and all those people. Um, go on, um, K Star. Kitty um, Callan. Yes, little things mean a lot. There you go. On the classical side of it, since you were also involved in it, do you have, do you have, some, do you have some favorite um, pieces of classical music? Or is it something you've totally disregarded? Oh, no, now? I haven't disregarded it. I appreciate it. I probably like it more, much more now than I did then. In fact, I, I must do because I hate it then because I was forced to play it. Um, I prefer sort of lyrical. Um, I like Vaughan Williams and I like Sibelius and Dvorak and things like that. And also, it depends if the, I'm in the mood, I can sort of listen to things like Penderecci, and I really like those too. But you have to be really, and you have to really concentrate on those sort of things. Mm -hmm. But I like really lyrical, symphonic works. And, like and Chopin's pretty pretty too. But I'm not, I, it depends what mood you're in, I think. To, you have to be in a really good mood to listen to classical music, because you just can't sort of do the housework and listen to it. You really have to sit down and appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Does uh, classical music, um, does it involve uh, part of your famous record collection? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, I don't think I've got that many classical records. I'm sort of only beginning to appreciate it now, I think. I mean, for example, in Barbados, you sit on the beach and listen to Vaughan Williams, and it was, it was incredible. And those are the sort of situations that I think you have to listen to classical music in. You have sort of, as I say, you just can't sort of dash around a house listening to bits and pieces of it. You just really have to, if someone's written a work, then you, uh, then you should sort of listen to it. It's like Keith Jarrett, you just can't sort of sit down and say, like, well, I'm just going to listen to a bit of this, and then off I go. You have to listen to the whole album. And, uh, those sort of albums are the, the ones you end up by playing mostly, I think. You know, yeah. It's really nice to actually sit down and listen to those sort of things. There's certainly a lot of feeling on, in, uh, especially the uh, Elton John album, the black-covered album, mm. of, um, I guess, that, that kind of uh, training that you've had. Yeah, the they're cla classical-influenced songs, I think you can tell. Um, 
things like 60 Years On mm -hmm. and uh, Greatest Discovery. Uh, and the first think, episode think, of High yeah. End, maybe. Mm -hmm. And th th they're sort of songs that, um, that have, I think the chord structures, you can say, are pretty classically orientated. There, are, there have been lots scattered throughout most of the albums. I tend to write a lot of songs like that. Mm -hmm. Can you ever see yourself uh, performing uh, on piano with uh, instrumentally with an orchestra? Uh, w would that be something that might, you might get uh, off on? I tried it a couple of times. It was murder. Because um, most of the string players in England, all they care about, they come in and they rehearse and then they read their newspapers and they drink their coffee and then on they pick up the uh, violin again and then they, they just don't want to know. You know, it's really a harrowing experience. I've done it twice. Once with session musicians mm -hmm. and once with the London Philharmonic, I think. And uh, both experiences I wouldn't want to go through again. Let's get back to um, you know your growth into music and uh, when you first started to play in a band, which was uh, when you were about 14, I think. Yeah, just some local lads, I had some friends of mine. We just had a like 10 watt amplifier, and we always we used to go through that. Uh, mostly playing Jerry Lee Lewis things and uh, Elvis Presley things, all American. I mean, there were no there was no English music scene at that time whatsoever. It, it, you know, it was all. It was all American records, and the the English people that were playing were just copying American records note for note. So. I mean, we just used to listen to American records and copy them note for note and then go out and try and play them. We had fun. I mean, it was like, those were the innocent days. Now, sometimes it's, sometimes they're the best, you know, when you just, uh, there were no worries about money or anything like that. We just used to go and meet in, some, in one of our houses. I think we used to take it in turns. And we used to play it. It was lovely. When did uh, your legendary meeting with uh, Long John Baldry come about? That was um, a big, big turning point in your career, wasn't it? Not in my career, I would say, but I mean, I learned a lot when I've played with John. Um, I mean, in, in the end, it, it was a big turning point because it made me get out of doing it, what I was doing. I, we'd been playing as a band uh, professionally and backing all these American singers like Doris Troy and La, Patti LaBelle and the Bells um, and Major Lance and people like that. And we were getting like $25 a week each for it and working hard and not really complaining, traveling up and down, doing sometimes like three gigs a day. And it was just learning. And at the time, as I say, it was really fun. Uh, but it got to us after a while, and we didn't didn't want to be a backing group the rest of our lives, so we decided to go solo, <laughs> uh, which we didn't do very well at. We went to Hamburg and did the, um, the usual thing over there, and we went to the south of France, and we played all the sort of in clubs in London at the time, like the Cromwellian and the Scottish St. James, and the Marquis as a support band, not and never headlining. It's to support Manfred Mann and people like that, Spencer Davis. And then Baldry came along just after the steam packet broke up, and sort of and suggested that he wanted to put this uh, sort of review on the road with featuring our singer Stuart, uh, another singer called Alan Walker. Well, you didn't play Stuart. You didn't uh, sing in those. No, bands. I was never you singing just in those. Days. No, I was just playing very bad Vox Continental organ. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I didn't sing. One last question about uh, John Baldry. Is he the someone in Someone Saved My Life Tonight? Is that was that? Oh yes, that's him. That yeah. was about John. Yeah. Well, I was going to get married. Mm -hmm. I had. Um, about three weeks to go, I had the furniture bought, I had everything ready. And uh, the only reason I was getting married, because she said she was pregnant, and I was sort of like, you know, doing the honourable gentleman bit. And I didn't really want to get married to her, because she hated it. Ever, every, anything I ever wrote, she sort of hated. And her favourite record was Girl Talk by Buddy Greco. And I, <laughs> she wouldn't listen to Nina Simone records and things like that. So I, decided, I went out with him one night, I got absolutely paralytically drunk for about the first time in my life, I think. And uh, Baldy said, "Listen, you're mad. You should, you know, you shouldn't really. You don't want to get married. I mean, you just run. You're going to ruin your life if you sort of get married to someone that you don't really want. It's just not fair on both of you." So um, I didn't, and she wasn't pregnant anyway. And I got sued for breach of promise, but who cares? I won. Don't you know. won the suit. Yeah. Well, she wasn't pregnant. And you really think if, if you and John hadn't gone out that night, uh, your oh, life might have taken a whole different turn? Completely. Yeah. I was. I mean, I was quite prepared to get married, and I, I would think it would have been a disaster because, as I say, she was very anti-music. John is great to work for. I mean, whenever I see him, I still feel like his piano player. In fact, he still treats me like his piano player. Um, but that eventually, inside, I just, I got to get out of this. I don't know, I don't care what I do, but I just cannot play to these sort of, in these cabaret places. So uh, while I was in the band, and at one point Caleb Quay was in the band as well, playing guitar, because uh, uh, I'd known Caleb for a long, long time, and uh, I decided to look around for something to do. Um, the only thing I thought I could do was songwriting, and I'd never tried that really. Only a couple of abortive efforts, which I never really played anybody. And you did at this point, you still didn't uh, have any idea that you could be a singer. Is that right? No, I never. No, I, did, I didn't want to be a singer. I just wanted to thought, well, I, 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 there seems to be a lucrative thing in songwriting, i.e., Backrack and David and uh -huh. Goffin and King. 
So uh, I look for. I didn't want to write lyrics, so I just answered this advert in the NME for Liberty Records, which now is United Artists, um, and uh, sort of got together with Bernie, this guy called Ray Williams. Said, "Well, this guy sent me lyrics. See what you think of them." And I suppose it was about six months before I actually got to meet Bernie, but I'd written a lot of music to the, those lyrics. And that was very a flower power at the time, you know. It was very beads and bells and joysticks time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the lyrics, I mean, I've heard some of the old demos, and I cannot believe them. I just cannot believe it. But I thought, I, I, I mean, I was so snobbish at the time, I thought they were, these lyrics were so good, they were above everybody else's. And when we look back and hear them, we just sat there the other day and cringed. It was very much the watercolour mentions of your mind period for us. Um, <laughs> anyway, we, I, <laughs> we, we eventually secured a, a, a songwriting contract. Originally, we were signed to Grelta a Music, which I don't think many people know, which is the Hollies, uh, Graham, Alan and Tony. We were signed to the Hollies, first of all, and then they didn't really sort of realise that we'd signed for them, and uh, eventually we, Dick James signed us and uh, gave us, said, listen, I'll give you 10 quid a week, and you write songs for Engelbert Humperdinck. And um, <laughs> that is exactly what we did, and that's the, t the point that I left Baldry's band. When I knew I had a secure sort of like income coming in, even though it was only a small amount. I just, I just sort of gave him my notice because I just couldn't stand it any longer. Once you and Bernie started uh, working together, um, did uh, a relationship form between the two of you? In other words, what I'm getting at is, are, are you two really great friends, aside from obviously being uh, very compatible uh, as far as uh, music and lyrics are concerned? Do you two see a lot of each other? Does uh, Is he a friend? Is he a confidant? Uh, much, used to be, uh, this sounds like it used to be much more than he is now, what a thing to say. But we used to um, sort of both live at my parents' uh, apartment, so in the early days we were much closer because we had nothing else to do. But once I actually started touring and things like that, which Bernie doesn't like really touring, um, we, we see less of each other. And uh, I, see him, I still see him quite a bit, but there's no way that we're as close now as we were. And I mean, I still look at him as sort of like a brother. I always sort of regard him as like a brother figure. Uh, but um, we have lost contact with each other a bit, just because I just this sort of touring hectic thing has just uh, forced us apart, really. Mm -hmm. Because he doesn't like to do it. You can't expect him to go on tour. It's really boring, very frustrating just to sit there night after night and watch somebody do something. Mm -hmm. And he's he's working on some things of his own now. He's getting a little bit of recognition on his own. He's working on the Captain Fantastic cartoon film, and uh, he's got his book out. And uh, I still feel very close to him, but there's no way. I mean, it's just like we used to just be with each other all the time so it's just there's no way we could be as close now as we were then it's probably also difficult for somebody to be uh, with somebody else a lot of the time when so much focus is placed on the other person uh, yeah it's, uh, it's yeah. always it's always very sad because I mean without Bernie Bernie starts the whole thing off you know I mean without Bernie's lyrics there would be no music there would be no touring there would be nothing and it's like he was on the Mike Douglas show yesterday and <laughs> he went on to sort of talk about his book, and then he's, and all the questions were like, "Well, what's Elton really like? What's he doing now?" And it's sort of, you know, it's a drag because he's always got this thing hanging around his neck, that he's just sort of like a cog in a wheel. Whereas the wheel would never turn if it wasn't for him. And it's it's very sad, and it's something that I think he gets generally heard about. You know. You never collaborated with anybody else, other than <laughs> Bernie Taupin. And, no, 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 so. no. That was it. I mean, I'm writing more with other people now, but. Uh, Definitely not. I mean, I would never consider writing with anybody else sort of permanently. I mean, Bernie and I can see Bernie and I going on forever, but I, I'm, I'm always encouraging him to write lyrics with other people mm. or for other people it's, uh, because I think it would be a good thing for him to do. Now, when you get the lyrics from Bernie, I know that's the way the song, the records usually um, um, come into fruition is you get the lyrics from Bernie and then you get and start and work it out into music. Do you, is it ever necessary? Do you ever make kind of like a lyric change or uh, as it's being put to music to create a musical phrase or an idea? Yeah, I think you have to with his lyrics. A can't spell. B, you, I mean, the original, <laughs> B, the original lyric things. Um, he's learned a lot since, but I mean, the original lyrics were just written line after line with no verse or anything. So you just, I used to have to sort of chop them up into verses, and uh, and each line was a different, uh, different length. Uh, there was no sort of iam iambic pentameter. I think is the phrase they say. Yeah. Um, <laughs> No, it, yeah, it's, it, I always alter all, you know, I mean, he doesn't write, yeah, 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 and <laughs> Benny, Benny, I mean, he doesn't sort of repeat things. I just have to do things like that. He's gotten a lot better um, as far as it's making it easier, but in the old days, uh, it used to be more or less impossible. I mean, for example, a song like, uh, first episode of High Anton was really just like a poem, really. It wasn't, it wasn't like a song, it was just written in 
with line after line. I thought, oh, what the hell am I going to do with this? But it always seems to work out for some reason. What happens? Does a, uh, an envelope show up in the mail one day and inside uh, of a <laughs> scribbled no, piece of paper? No, that's only occurred during the last couple of years because, as I say, we've sort of grown apart and I'm always at one place and he's the other. I mean, he always turns up at recording sessions at the end because he doesn't like to sit through the whole six weeks of doing it. Uh, but it started at the chateau with um, the factory process, as I call it, with him writing the lyrics upstairs, Maxine typing them out and bringing them down to me on the piano, and songs would get written like While that. While the sessions are going on. Yeah, I was sort of my Motown period. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, but it, it more or less, it's got to the point now where I sort of suggested a couple of ties, suggest a couple of titles and a couple of lines, and we work that way, that which has never happened before. Like, don't go breaking my heart, I came up with the title and. I should say probably 30 or 40 percent of the lyrics, and there's a couple of other things on the album which I've on the album that's going to come out when I don't know, but uh, it has uh, a couple of two or three of my ideas, and I have to phone him up and say, listen, I've got this song called this, and I want it's very hard for him to do it, but he does it. it always comes up with the goods. There's a song, one song on the new album called "Sorry" seems to be the hardest word, which uh, again is about 40 percent of my lyrics, uh, but we we're coll collaborating like that, more like that now. But you say in the old days, occasionally one did just kind of show up. Uh, Bernie got an idea and sat down and wrote, scribbled out some song and just uh, mail it out to you or something? No, because we were always living together. Oh, I, I mean, we sort of lived together for about four or five years before, or three or four years before we eventually got married and then uh, success started. When, when, once we came over here and we were successful, um, that more or less sort of shoved us apart, really, because there was no way we could stay together. How about the uh, the kind of arrangements and orchestrations of a song? I've always felt that a, that a, a pop record there was really three main parts. There's like there's the music and the lyrics, and then equally important is the way the record is arranged, how it hooks, how um, strings come in, how overdubs are used, and all of yeah. that. Is that basically something that you create when you uh, when you while you're writing the song? Do you also write the sound of the song? Yeah, I think when you write a song, you envisage how you want it to sound. Very rarely do they ever come out on record how you really want them to sound. Uh, it's just something happens. Something always gets a little twisted, and uh, they never, never usually come out exactly how you first envisaged them. Uh, <clears throat> when we wait, I, I'm dismissing the Empty Sky album for a minute because that wasn't so much an arranged album. Uh, but the Elton John album, for example, was uh, everything. We sat down and planned it, and it was all arranged and more or less written note for note. So I knew more or less what was going to come out at the end, except I didn't know what the string arrangements were going to be like. But um, that was all done live. Strings, piano, a lot. Because we had a budget, and uh, in those days it was a very big budget for someone who didn't sell a record. So we just did that all live within one week. And I was, that was one of the most harrowing experiences of my life, just because I was sitting there going through that lot. I mean, playing with string players is sort of like, could read straight off and I was sitting there hoping not to make a mistake. And we didn't overdub in those days because we just couldn't afford to. So, uh, but when, when you do write a song, um, especially now, I mean, you can afford to sit back and do, the, put a very basic rhythm track and then build on it bit by bit, which we didn't have the luxury of doing in sort of like the Elton John tumbleweed empty sky days. We just, well, actually up to the madman across the water, we still had to worry about budgets and things like that. So in a record like, uh, let's say, for instance, uh, Island Girl, and then there's something where the music stops and those uh, and the guitars kind of go... Mm. Yeah. Then you kind of hear that when you're creating the song. Oh, or... I don't think you can hear that. I mean, those sort of little things like that happen when you actually make the record, and it's not... Sometimes it's not my suggestion even, I mean, within this sort of band that we've got now, and even with the old band, people, the musicians in the studio would come up with ideas which um, were really good. And they're not just my ideas, I think it's just the people who played on you haven't produced any of your own albums at all? No. Do you think that's a good idea for an artist to produce himself on, on records? Uh, it depends on the artist. Sometimes it's good for them, sometimes it's bad. Um, I would like to produce myself eventually and do something, you know, because everything, every artist does want to have a go. There's a very big danger of getting very self-indulgent, mm -hmm. which I think has happened to a lot of artists who just sort of thrived with a good producer and then when they shoved them out and then started producing themselves you can see the the little inadequacies popping up here and there which um, you can get into you can get very self-indulgent um, I think some people handle it very well I think Joni handles it very well and Jackson Brown and people like that I think they more or less produce their own records um, but I think on the whole I think you do have to have someone to sort of go against you even if it's just for argument's sake take the so, long yeah, look at it and yeah, step say, back from it Perhaps you should do this instead of that. I mean, in the end, I'm sort of, I've got 99% of control of what goes on. If I don't like a mix or I don't like something on a record, then it's always done again. 
Speaking Except in the early days when I was to say, we didn't have any choice. <laughs> Speaking of the early days, can you remember um, the very first time you were in a recording session to work professionally making a record? Um, yeah, I made a single called I've Been Loving You, uh, which came out on Philips in England. Uh, and I made that in Dick James' studio in the Oxford Street. It was four track. Uh, it was very, pretty exciting. I mean, we made records as Bluesology, but I'm, I'm discounting that because I just can't even remember those sessions. Were they released? Bluesology? Oh, records? absolutely. Yeah. Oh, Two records on Fontana. One was called, which I wrote actually, I can, and sang. All oh, right. I can't believe it. I mean, when I look back, I thought, well, how come I ended up by singing them? Because I never used to sing in the band whatsoever, but I did. One was called Come Back Baby, which is dreadful. And the other one's called Mr. Frantic, which is probably the worst record ever made. And there was a record on Polydor, which I played on uh, Bluesology, but um, written by an English guy called Kenny Lynch. And Stuart Brown sang the lead on that. But I, was f I could never figure out why I sang on those first two records, because as I say, I never used to sing. Well, when did you finally realize, hey, I'm, I could sing? Well, I got pushed into it, you see. I the songwriting thing didn't work out as far as writing songs for other people goes, because, I mean, nobody wanted, to, nobody recorded any of our songs, so the proof of the pudding was in the eating, we just weren't very good at it. And when Steve Brown sort of joined Dick James Music and said, listen, what you're doing is basically absolute rubbish, which we knew, but when someone tells you it really hurts, you know, you know <laughs> yeah. uh, why don't you start doing things that you really want to? Well, we did write other songs apart from that, but we never played them to anybody. And we started writing things like Skyline Pigeon and things like that. And it, I had to sing them. There was no one else singing them. I mean, no one. They, they were sort of very personal songs. They were songs I was pleased with. So I didn't want anybody to else, else to sing them except me. Uh, and that sort of start when I thought, oh, perhaps I might, you know, like to make records as a singer. I never, I never realised it would get to this proportion. I mean, I always wanted, like I just say, I just wanted to be a composer. I uh, never ever wanted to go out on the road again. How that ever happened was so ridiculous. The idea of uh, getting up and performing and singing in front of large audiences at that time, there was a kind of a frightening notion. It wasn't even a notion. I didn't really have any idea about doing it. I, I made the Empty Sky album. I made a couple of singles, Lady Samantha and I've Been Loving You. Um, and then I made the Elton John album, which was a, a lot of money, as I said, for an unknown artist to be spent, you know, 5,000 pounds that album cost which was unheard of, right? albums were only just beginning to start catching on. And that didn't sell either when it came out, even though it was hailed as a really great album by the press and, and the disc jockeys and people like that, the radio people, it didn't sell. And it's always been the case in England uh, that groups only make it if you, you go out on the road and are prepared to put in all the groundwork, and then your records will start selling because you get a following. It's sort of like, you know, it's, it's the same everywhere. If a, a, work, a, a group works hard enough, eventually they start to sell records, i.e. Aerosmith, Kiss, example, example. Like that. So um, that's what I had to do. I had to be persuaded to go out on the road, which I just fought tooth and nail against. I didn't want ever to do it. And it was so difficult in those days because I, nobody knew anything about amplifying pianos. I played on upright pianos. But it was, it was different. People liked it because it was just piano, bass and drums. And it wasn't Emerson, Lake and Palmer, but it was... Um, I don't know, it was <laughs> pretty peculiar because it was, as I say, really hard to get a, a good piano or even mic a piano in those days. We had no idea, we were so naive. I think that's about where I first started to hear about you. Is I was working, uh, doing a show for the uh, ABC FM syndicated network, and this is 1970 now, and got a hold of uh, not empty, well, the Empty Sky album and the Elton John album, which were not yet released in the United States. Right, we couldn't find anybody to put them out. Right, and I don't think anybody was playing the records, and we heard them at ABC and loved them and started to play them a lot, and got enormous feedback on it. And people who were listening to the ABC FM stations in New York, it was WABC FM, started to ask for them a lot. And um, that was just about the time that you came over for your first visit to the United States. Yeah, I didn't even want to come to that either. See, <laughs> everything's worked out. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, <laughs> so we have, eventually, I, got, I I thought, oh, all right, I go. I really just wanted to go to a record shop. That was all. I didn't really. I thought, oh, we're going. I had no idea what was going to happen. And it all it all happened because of that silliness at the Troubadour. Uh, August nineteen seventy. Yeah. How many nights did you play the Troubadour during that famous? Uh, time when the place five. where you so so called happened five i think two, five two shows i think there was two shows on weekdays and three at the weekend and then it built as the five days progressed until yeah. towards the end of the five days well, it was the crazy the first day was i mean i i can remember the first day and the second day probably f just full of press and business people because the word was out and i couldn't believe it you know it was just full of all those sort of people i think very few street people actually came and saw us at those gigs it was like the industry were just scrambling over themselves to get tickets 
Um, so I always count my first American gig as Philadelphia as Electric Factory, where there was you know, just playing to people. Um, but it was totally ludicrous because I was playing second on the bill, top of the bill rather, over David Ackles, who in England was really like a, a quite well known. He got sold out a lot of places in England. He'd been uh, he had success because uh, Julie Driscoll had done Road to Cairo and Down River was a big record, and uh, he really sort of. Bernie and I idolised him. We came over to the Troubadour, and there we were playing above him. We couldn't believe it. And it turned out to be the Elton John show rather than the David Ackles show. Yeah, in people's uh, minds. But, uh, and I just said that totally amazed me. First of all, and uh, it was really fun playing with David Ackles because he's such a nice person. Anyway, and he was. I mean, it, that was the thrill for me just to be playing with David Ackles. So when all the, uh, the rest of it started, and I did the shake a million hands in Hollywood time, um, I was so bewildered by it all. I couldn't believe it. Um, I think it was very good for me to sort of happen like that because in the end I saw so many bullshit artists come through the door you know, with their families and things. I just thought, well, this is ridiculous, you know. All of a sudden everybody wanted to uh, know yeah. you. <laughs> One minute I'm nothing and then this minute everybody was like falling over themselves to get to know me. So I sort of, that's probably a good thing that that happened that, like that because uh, otherwise I think it could have been a bit dangerous. But I immediately left America thinking, oh, God, you know, I've got to be where all these people are going to latch on to me, which, I mean, several people did want to become my manager and threatened to follow me around the country. I could name names, but I won't, um, until I signed management contracts with them. It was all that bit. And I think I was so off, I was so caught off guard that I sort of went into my shell and thought, I'm not going to do anything like that. I'm just going to sort out the good people from the bad. Do you think you've been successful in doing that? Yeah, I think so. Uh, it's very hard, uh, but I've always had pretty good people around me. Um, and Yeah, I think it's been successful. Well, if the Troubadour in August of 70 was the big um, West Coast event that made a lot of people aware of Elton John, I think it was a, a double uh, barrel thing that happened here in New York a few months later. And uh, one was, I think, the WABC FM live broadcast, yeah. which was followed, I think, only a few days later by your appearance at the Fillmore yeah. with uh, McKendry Spring and, and Leon, Leon Russell. Russell. Right, yeah. And by the time that was all over, which I think all happened within a week, if I remember correctly. Yeah, probably. Things were happening so fast in those days. Mm -hmm. I remember doing eight interviews in one day. I still think we're doing that now. Um, yeah, th things did happen fast. I think that, that's correct. I remember playing the Fillmore. Uh, and I'm, I remember doing the, the radio broadcast very well. I remember oh. following the radio broadcast. We all came back to the station, you and Nigel and Dee and uh, some of us who Mary were Mary Travers. In, Mary Travers, right? And we were in a little in a little room there, listening to the playback yeah. of the tapes. And my remembering that evening was that you were very high and very exalted at the way you actually played that night. I remember you saying things like, "I've never played piano." Like well, that, it's because we wore headphones. If you remember, That's everybody right. wore headphones, like doing a recording session actually, <clears throat> and playing to a hundred people. Everyone could actually hear what everyone else was doing, which is a great problem on stage. You can never actually hear 100% of what everybody else is doing. But if you wear headphones, that's why Nigel, after that, that's what made him wear headphones all the time. Because uh, it was so crystal clear, and so you played better. You release and make a lot of records, all of uh, enormously fine quality, all of which sell. You probably release more music than anybody that I can think of. Um, do you think there's, is there a danger in doing that, in, in, in putting out so much music? Well, in those days, we didn't, we, it was a shame because uh, as the Elton John album didn't come out in America until it had been out in England for, for like seven or eight months. Right. And by which time Tumbleweed was more or less out anyway. So by the time the Elton John album had got acceptance, they had to release Tumbleweed pretty quickly after it because they were importing it. Mm -hmm. And then that started off the grand old uh, an Elton John album a month competition. Uh, We'd already signed previously to come into the States to do the Friends soundtrack, so we did that, and that kept Paramount released a million copies on one day and got 900,000 back the next. Um, <laughs> my first, I call it my bootleg gold album. Right. Which right. brings us around to the subject of Elton John rumors. Oh. <clears throat> Let's see, what are some of the latest ones that I've heard? All right. Oh, just last week, a friend of mine said, is it true Elton John tried to commit suicide? And, uh, there are various others. I guess there's always one of the week. Do you have any favorites? Any favorite Elton John rumors? Um, oh, there was f plenty when I was in Canada. My hair transplant room was the best. Yeah. I mean, waking up and seeing the Toronto Star and reading that I was just had a hair transplant and that my scalp was still bleeding. That was wonderful. <laughs> and that went, that went across the whole world. That was just on the wires. You know, and everyone keeps coming up saying, well, don't you? they made a very good job, you know. <laughs> I, I never had it done. Um, oh, I'm always... Rumors that I bought so many things... Um, 
mostly them to do with money. Like I've got something that I bought six cars in one day, or I've just bought a house that's worth three million dollars, and I bought a I suppose I've bought a restaurant in Los Angeles for three and three hundred thousand dollars. Constantly amazes me. I guess uh, that, that probably comes about with um, the the news, uh, which was a big story at least here in the United States, about you holding the record for. I guess it was making the most money as a recording artist last year in the history of people who made records, some incredible figure. Well, I don't really know if that's true. I, it might be. I, th I mean, I, I probably made a lot of money, but uh, I don't know if it's true. I, mean, I don't know who actually s sort of prints that. We never put out a statement to that effect. I think if we did, we'd be silly because of, you don't exactly put out statements encouraging the tax people, do mm -hmm. you? Uh, so I just think it was just some made it up, but I mean, I really have no um, no idea how much money I did make last year. Is it is it does it ever, does is it a burden to make uh, enormous amounts of money? Well, you mentioned tax people. That obviously is a hassle. Uh, well, is, is having a lot of? I mean, I know it's everybody's at least in the Western world. I guess everybody's dream is having, a, you know, being able to jump into a big barrel of money and just having <laughs> untold wealth. Uh, is the problems come along with that? Oh, absolutely. I mean always problems with money. I mean, people wanting to know you, people working for you start ripping you off. Um, it's, it's com uh, it is, if you've got a lot of money, then it's, it's just very, it's a lot of complications. I honestly don't know how much money I've got. I know how much money I should have, but I don't know how much money I've, I, I mean, I've got trustworthy people around me. Um, but, I mean, by the time tax, the tax is paid, I don't know how much money is left. I don't really care. I really, that's never really, bothered me for a long time now. I mean, when I initially came over and I started getting like a thousand dollars a concert and then it used to go up to, to ten, it was up to ten thousand dollars within six months. Yeah, I mean, that was exciting because it was like sort of like an achievement. But from that point onwards, I don't really, it doesn't really bother me that much. It's just nice to have. Um, I, I've got this great reputation for, for being the world's biggest spender. I don't think I am, really. Uh, it's just that when everybody mentions money, they think of me, they don't think that... Uh, Bob Dylan might go out and buy something or something because everybody does spend money. It's just that they always pick on me. Does that bother you at all? Not now. Yeah. I'm used to it. Does Does it change your own your your own values, your own priorities? Does I mean are the things that were once important to you the things that are still important to you or? Uh... Yeah, my record collection. <laughs> I still collect. Yeah, I mean, I think you go through periods of being stupid with money. I mean, like, I mean, I love cars. You know. I, and at one point, I used to buy one a week and things like that, which was actually stupid. It was just like all my fantasies, I suppose, carrying it out. And then I just suddenly thought, oh, this is ridiculous, you know. So I think as you get older, he said, groaning at 29, um, <laughs> you tend to get a little, you know. I mean, I used to go in New York, for example, I used to come here and I used to go out shopping every day and buy, you know, just buy for the sake of buying. Just, I think it's because I never had that much money in my hand before, but uh, I don't do that anymore. I think you just, there is a point where money just tends to lose a bit of value. I think peace of mind is far more important than uh, money. That's why I chose to stay in England rather than uh, live in America. Although I have a house in America, which I use when I go to Los Angeles, I'm, I'm st I still live in England because I had to decide at one point I had to be honest. I said, well, I'm going to, am I going to stay somewhere where I'm going to be happy or am I going to spend the rest of my life going around the world dodging paying taxes and then spending the, like, the good years of my life just dodging paying taxes? <laughs> I, I, there was no fun, I didn't think, running around the world. I just wanted a, a stable place to stay in. And for you, England is a more comfortable place to live than the United yeah, States? Yeah, for me, yeah. And I, I wouldn't like to live in, in, in America all the time. And I, I don't like living in England all the time. I mean, I like to get... Um, the great thing about my, the amount of money I earn is that I can suddenly say, well, I'm going to go to Canada tomorrow, I'm going to go to Red China or something, whatever I want to do. And with England, But England's a nice base. It's a, a concrete base for me. It has My friends are all there, my relations, uh, my house, uh, my pets. And uh, you do need a base, I think. And I, I think England's a pretty good base. And these stories about taxation things, don't you believe half the things you hear? I mean, you pay 50% tax in America. I think the most tax I pay is 68%, which is still a lot, but it's only 18%. And I'd rather have eight, pay 18% more tax and, and have peace of mind than sort of be miserable and just spend it somewhere where I didn't want to live anyway. I read something which said that you, of all people, understand stardom for the public fantasy. Uh, I think what this writer was saying was that um, 
there is some need that all of us as human beings have to yeah. put somebody way up high, you know, whether it's the stars of the 30s or even, I just thought of this yesterday also, the Queen of England is in New York right now. <laughs> and um, there was a tremendous outpouring of people, New Yorkers, mm -hmm. just to look at the Queen on Lexington Avenue where she went shopping in Bloomingdale's or whatever. And I was thinking that the Queen, in a, in a sense, is, or, or our president or whatever, they're all, it's all like pop stars in a sense. Mm. That we seem to have this need of looking at people who, after all, are only other human beings, only other people, and making them larger than life. And somebody said that you understand the need for that, and, and, and your, your image as an entertainer feeds, and, 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 and not, I don't know if feeds is the right word, but goes along with that, and that's why people love you so much. Uh, I think my image is sort of, is, um, how can I say it? Um, it's not, it's sort of an out of the. I don't know, it's a one-off image in rock and roll, you know, I don't sort of... I'm everything that rock and roll, a rock and roll star isn't supposed to be, as far as... I'm not the best-looking person in the world, etc., etc. I sort of think a lot of people identify with me as sort of, well, if he can do it, then I might be able to. <laughs> um, it's, it's true, I think a lot of people do think like that. And I always encourage that sort of thing, was, anyway, because um, I always believe that if you have got enough ambition, no matter what you look like, no matter what you sound like, you can make it anyway, if you've got enough ambition. And I am ambitious. I mean, I'm, I'm an amb ambitious person. Uh, but, I mean, when I, went, I was given the sort of key of the city of Philadelphia the other day, and I met the mayor, and that, it makes me, f I mean, really frightened. I thought, oh, my God, I'm so... <laughs> this, is, this is the big thing. I mean, this is the big thing, politics, and you could feel everything was very uh, huge in, in, in the mayor's office, and, uh, and the pop star bit doesn't really mean anything. I mean, this... The real feelings of fright, frightening things that I've gotten, I, I've sort of been with political people and you sort of become a bit o overawed and politics is very big and very frightening and it makes me feel like a, a, a very small goldfish because that, that is the real power trip, politics. Does it hold any fascination for you? No Elton, way. Elton John uh, in politics, that's a, oh. that in itself is a frightening notion. Yeah, no, I mean to be one, you've got to be, I think you must be slightly insane to want to become president of the United States. Some people might would think that about you've got to be slightly insane to want to be a rock and roll star. No, not if you, uh, no. It's, I mean, far more people would probably want to be a rock and roll star than want to be president of the United sure. States. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, I'm just living out my fantasies as a child. Is that why you got into kind of the whole um, uh, trip of uh, costumes and the glasses and the outrageousness of Elton John on stage? This larger than life for you. Well, it's a big myth, all this, you see, because I was doing this when I came over to the Troubadour, and it suddenly just didn't come because I sold a few records. We came over to the Troubadour, and everybody thought I was going to be like Randy Newman, with probably on a Valium or something. Um, <laughs> God, imagine that. Uh, and I wasn't. I mean, I stood on the piano, played. I, I wore these ridiculous. Um, I was wearing jeans then. Da -da 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 -da. But uh, I was wearing Mr. Freedom boot, flying boots, and things like that. And I've always been starred t-shirts and things like which hadn't appeared in the states i've always sort of dressed like that and i uh, came over still on top of the piano and played rock and roll and this bit about me well once he's once he started selling records he turned commercial and started wearing silly clothes and everything well i'd always done it anyway i'd always sort of sort of tried to have a sense of humor about the stage set, uh, set up because um i don't know it's part of me i think there's a, a very humorous side to um, to music too kind it's of sort of like vaudeville, the absurdity of it yes yeah, I mean, I, stu I still, I mean, I'm 100% behind my music and I, I love playing music on stage and I want it to be the best possible. But I've been to so many concerts where people are so into their music that it's downright boring and sort of self-indulgent. Um, and I, I have to communicate with an audience. I just cannot sit there and, and not say one word or involve them. I have to do it. And the, the clothes thing is a myth. And I've been doing that for ages. And uh, the glasses thing was just, the, I suddenly thought, well, I was really fed up with wearing those square glasses. I thought I must get some more glasses, and that sort of evolved from there. From then, it's, I think I helped in creating a sort of glasses revolution in a way because <laughs> sure. ev everybody can sort of wear. Well, it's you know, there are no limits the to it. The optometrists must love you. Know, in, like, I hate rules. You know, so they say you cannot wear this, you cannot do this, you cannot, you can't wear those glasses. Or there, there are no rules in life. Only the ones you, you know, you should try and mm -hmm. get away from rules and things like that. Well, I think you've answered one question, that even though you, of anybody making records, in my opinion, uh, probably appeal to the broadest kind of people, from Las Vegas lounge uh, people to Fillmore uh, 
Winterland, Madison Square Garden, whatever. But you, you are, you consider yourself a rock and roller. Just a rock oh, I so, always have done. Yeah. You've had the opportunity of meeting um, a lot of very legendary figures. Uh, just a few come to mind that, for some reason or other, I have the impression that you've got to know. And I would like to ask you about them, maybe like Groucho Marx, who's somebody that I hold in great esteem. And uh, you've got, you've had an opportunity to be with Groucho. Yeah, several times. M incredible man. Um, very funny, very frightening to meet the first time because you can't tell whether he's being serious or not. And the uh, first time I met him was at uh, Malibu. I had a house rented there. It was uh, all the pictures on the Don't Shoot Me album were done there. And we had a, we got someone to bring him over for dinner. Um, and we knew that he liked to be warm, so we had this fire on. It was like 90 degrees out. We had the <laughs> logs on the fire. We found out what he liked to eat, and um, I, mean, I was just like, petrified of him because everyone said, "Well, he can be a bit funny," and then we just walk out the door. You know? So he came, and uh, his first words to me was, "When? When do we eat? <laughs> <laughs> when do we eat?" <laughs> and he was wearing a beret and an overcoat, and carrying a cigar. Like, yeah, and it was very uncomfortable for a first hour and a half, and then he just completely loosened up. And was he aware of you? Does he listen to rock and no, roll? No, he didn't know who the hell I was. He still doesn't really. I mean, he, he, <laughs> he thinks I should be called John Elton. In fact, he sent me a, um, a poster saying to John Elton from Mark Scroucher. Um, <laughs> you can never, you can never figure out why I'm Elton. Um, he no, he doesn't really know who I am. I think he's much more aware now than he was then. But at the time, he didn't have any idea. But he was really sweet. And once he loosened up, he was. He's a very, very funny man. He had just. Well, you, what can you do in situations like that? You just sit back and listen because. You can't really contribute. All you want to hear is this man talking and telling jokes and talking about the films. And it's it's like Mae Westry. Really. I met her a couple of times, and you don't say anything. You just it's like having an audience with someone who's legendary. I mean, there are several people I regret that I haven't met, like um, Noel Coward and people like that. People you always hear great stories about, and uh, I'm sure they they were very very amusing people. How about Catherine Hepburn? Oh yeah, she's another uh, another incredible. I mean, just total. Um, Unbelievable! I've never met anybody like her ever. She just totally takes control. She just—I mean, you meet her within five minutes. She's got your whole room redone out, and she's moved the furniture. And Enormous energy. Yeah, and you don't—you don't have—you don't, have, don't even think of answering back or anything because she just takes her an amazing energy. For that, for that, I mean, she's sixty, whatever. She did double flips off my swimming pool diving board. And incredible! I mean, really amazing lady. I said she, 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 she can leave you absolutely breathless within five minutes. You just can't get a word in its way. Amazing. And I guess most of the Beatles are people that you have now, I mean, well, you've worked with uh, John uh, yeah. on record and uh, seen all of them. I know, yeah, John for me is the magic one. Um, I know Ringo, I, I, I'm very friendly with Ringo, but I, creatively I'm, I love Paul's stuff, you know, some of Paul's stuff, but for me, John is my favorite. As a person, as a human being, I think he's incredible. He, I mean, he'll talk to anybody. That's what I admire about him. He'll just talk. If so you came in this room now, he doesn't care who anybody is. He'll just strike up a conversation, which is not an easy thing to do. I would tend, if I walked into a room, I would tend to go into my shell. But he's very open. And he's been through, I think, most things that anybody can go through. And uh, he's come out in, on the other side of it all so so well and so nice. He's got, he's got a sort of public image that it's so different to actually how he is. It's like Billie Jean King has this public image of being so aggressive, but actually she's completely, she is aggressive, but she's uh, nicely aggressive. And um, she's just a superhuman being, and so is John. So uh, when we just started doing Lucy in the Sky, and I just, John was knocked out when he heard about it. And when I did Whatever Gets You Through the Night that session, I invited him up to Caribou and said, listen, will you play on it? So he said, yeah. And uh, he ended up by playing on it, Dr. Winston O'Boogie. It was just like, I just wanted to do, because I, I love his songs, and we did One Day at a Time on the B-side. I just wanted to do a couple of his things. What are your feelings about all of this baloney about a Beatle revival? And I think reading? it's a hideous idea. Um, and whoever started the rumours really done well, because like, the Beatles albums are all got back in the charts. <laughs> yeah, and he, right. he had eight singles in the charts in England in the top 30. Um, <laughs> it's happening now in the United States. Too. Yeah, and with the, um, even the White Albums in the top 50, I think. Mm -hmm. or so uh, I think it was probably put about by someone on the Paul McCartney camp before the wings took. Cause <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, no, things like that happen. But I just think it would be just... It's just not on. I can't see it. If, it. if it ever did come about, I'd be the most surprised person in the world. I'd, I would hate it if it came about as well. The thing is, it seems to me that there's some people have to stretch back because they're 
not as excited about rock and roll now as they might have been in the late 60s. What do you think about the state of rock and roll in 1976? Um, I think it's, I don't think it's that bad. I think there are a lot of good music, I think there's a lot of good music around. Um, a lot of people that have waited their turn are, are starting to really sell records that are good. I mean, there's some great albums around. I don't think it's that bad. I think there's always in human, um, in show business, a sort of urge for people to come back that have been out of the limelight. It's like when Sinatra sort of right. retired. I mean, there's always, wouldn't it be great if the Beatles got back together again? But I think it's people that never actually had the chance of seeing them live, you know, on stage together. And in fact, you know, they only did 20 minutes, doesn't even enter their heads, you know. Uh, I think it's just a great nostalgic thing towards that. Uh, that's why the McCartney tour um, did so well, because people hadn't, I mean, it couldn't fail anyway, but people were doubly interested to see him over here because I hadn't seen him playing live on stage since the Beatles. Mm -hmm. And that's why I wanted to see the concert over here because it's sort of like the reaction is so much better than in England because he's done tours of England anyway. I, I think it's, uh, I, it would be a very sad thing if the Beatles got back together again and played live because I know that they, they just couldn't do it. How about if they made an album? They didn't play live but worked on an album together. Um, yeah, well, that's interesting, yeah. I, I wouldn't say that's beyond the realms of impossibility. Yeah, I find that an interesting Yeah, thing. I would rather have an album than have a concert. I agree. How about reggae? You think that's a vital yeah. force in music? No. <laughs> there are selected reggae things uh, throughout the years that I've liked. Desmond Decker and uh, Toots and the Maytals, a couple of things. The singles, more or less, than albums. But an album of reggae just drives me around the cr just up the wall. But the, the Bob Marley is an exception. The Live at the Lyceum album is fantastic. But, uh, no, it's okay. You once described yourself as being the John Denver of rock and roll. Okay. What did you mean by that? Uh, it's going back to the personality thing, probably the housewife situation. Um, I have this, uh, well, I have this cutesy, cutesy image, you know, um, with most people off stage, so um, in the audience, and I, that's what John Denver has. Uh, so it's something I'm landed with. That's all I could compare myself to. Mm -hmm. John Denver of rock and roll. In fact, when I was going through the airport in Los Angeles the other day, these four bouffant ladies said, "My God, it's John Denver!" <laughs> <laughs> but I couldn't believe it. I had these huge white glasses on, and I forgot. There seems to be a, a great kind of search going on, at least in the United States, for deeper meanings in life, and people running, uh, uh, identifying with uh, this guru and that guru, and higher consciousness, and whatever you want to call it. Um, I don't know what this, you know, what the rush to Nirvana is all about, but that's do you the Indian restaurant up the road, <laughs> right, 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 <laughs> on top of the plaza. What, what do, you, do you have any 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 feelings about that? Do you find any any emptiness in your own life, or any need for some kind of a spiritual search or religion or? What no, have you? I've never. Sort of, I've always sort of been fairly um, open-minded about religion. I'm not anti-religion whatsoever. I'm not a religious person. Um, I think there are times. That you do feel low in spirit, and it, it, I think that's when friends will come to the rescue a lot. And if you have really good close friends, I think most people who have like five or six really good close friends in the matters of crisis, you would help them out and they would help you out. And everybody goes through the depressing things, and I think if you've got a good friend, I've always found that it helps me out a bit. Uh, this is the land of the psychiatrist. Uh, I, I, I don't think I'd ever actually go to a psychiatrist because I, I think, well, if, if I can't really sort my own problems out, and my friends can't help me sort them out, then I, 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 I don't want to know. But it's probably a very staid old English view. I don't know. I just, that's my opinion. Okay. Thanks, Alden. Thank you.